Ananda 5th, 4th century BCE was the primary attendant of the Buddha and one of his ten principal disciples. Among the Buddha's many disciples, Ananda stood out for having the best memory. Most of the texts of the early Buddhist Sutta Pitaka Pali, Sanskrit, Sutra Pitaka are attributed to his recollection of the Buddha's teachings during the First Buddhist Council. For that reason, he is known as the treasurer of the Dhamma, with Dhamma Sanskrit, Dharma referring to the Buddha's teaching. In early Buddhist texts, Ananda was the first cousin of the Buddha. Although the early texts do not agree on many parts of Ananda's early life, they do agree that Ananda was ordained as a monk and that Punamantaniputta Sanskrit, Purna became his teacher. Twenty years in the Buddha's ministry, Ananda became the attendant of the Buddha, when the Buddha selected him for this task. Ananda performed his duties with great devotion and care, and acted as an intermediary between the Buddha and the laypeople, as well as the Sangha Sanskrit, Samgha, lit. Monastic community. He accompanied the Buddha for the rest of his life, acting not only as an assistant, but also a secretary and a mouthpiece. Scholars are skeptical about the historicity of many events in Ananda's life, especially the First Council, and consensus about this has yet to be established. A traditional account can be drawn from early texts, commentaries, and post-canonical chronicles. Ananda had an important role in establishing the order of bhikkhunis Sanskrit, bisuni, lit. None, when he requested the Buddha on behalf of the latter's foster mother Mahapajapati Gotami Sanskrit, Mahaprajapati Gautami to allow her to be ordained. Ananda also accompanied the Buddha in the last year of his life, and therefore was witness to many tenets and principles that the Buddha conveyed before his death, including the well-known principle that the Buddhist community should take his teaching and discipline as their refuge, and that he would not appoint a new leader. The final period of the Buddha's life also shows that Ananda was very much attached to the Buddha's person, and he saw the Buddha's passing with great sorrow. Shortly after the Buddha's death, the First Council was convened, and Ananda managed to attain enlightenment just before the Council started, which was a requirement. He had a historical role during the Council as the living memory of the Buddha, reciting many of the Buddha's discourses and checking them for accuracy. During the same council, however, he was chastised by Mahakasapa Sanskrit, Mahakasyapa and the rest of the Sangha for allowing women to be ordained and failing to understand or respect the Buddha at several crucial moments. Ananda continued to teach until the end of his life, passing on his spiritual heritage to his pupils Sanavasi Sanskrit, Sanakavasi and Majantaka Sanskrit, Madhyantaka, among others, who later assumed leading roles in the Second and Third Councils. Ananda died twenty years after the Buddha, and stupas monuments were erected at the river where he died. Ananda was one of the most loved figures in Buddhism. He was known for his memory, erudition and compassion, and was often praised by the Buddha for these matters. He functioned as a foil to the Buddha, however, in that he still had worldly attachments and was not yet enlightened, as opposed to the Buddha. In the Sanskrit textual traditions, Ananda is considered the patriarch of the Dhamma, who stood in a spiritual lineage, receiving the teaching from Mahakasapa and passing them on to his own pupils. Ananda has been honored by bhikkhunis since early medieval times for his merits in establishing the nuns' order. In recent times, the composer Richard Wagner and Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore were inspired by stories about Ananda in their work. Name The word Ananda means bliss, joy in Pali and in Sanskrit. Pali commentaries explain that when Ananda was born, his relatives were joyous about this. Texts from the Mulasarvastivada tradition, however, state that since Ananda was born on the day of the Buddha's enlightenment, there was great rejoicing in the city. Hence the name.
Topic: Accounts. Topic: Previous lives. According to the texts, in a previous life, Ananda made an aspiration to become a Buddha's attendant. He made this aspiration in the time of a previous Buddha called Padumatara, many eons Pali, Kappa, Sanskrit, Kalpa before the present age. He met the attendant of Padumatara Buddha and aspired to be like him in a future life. After having done many good deeds, he made his resolution known to the Padumatara Buddha, who confirmed that his wish will come true in a future life. After having been born and reborn throughout many lifetimes, and doing many good deeds, he was born as Ananda in the time of the current Buddha Gautama. <laughs> Early life Ananda was born in the same time period as the Buddha formerly Prince Siddhartha, which scholars place at 5th–4th centuries BCE. Tradition says that Ananda was the first cousin of the Buddha, his father being the brother of Suddhodana Sanskrit, Suddhodana, the Buddha's father. In the Pali and Mulasarvastivada textual traditions, his father was Amitodhana Sanskrit, Amartodhana, but the Mahavasta states that his father was Suklodhana. both are brothers of Suddhodana. The Mahavasta also mentions that Ananda's mother's name was Murji Sanskrit, lit. Little Deer, Pali is unknown. The Pali tradition has it that Ananda was born on the same day as Prince Siddhartha Sanskrit, Siddhartha, but texts from the Mulasarvastivada and subsequent Mahayana traditions state Ananda was born at the same time the Buddha attained enlightenment when Prince Siddhartha was 29 years old, and was therefore much younger than the Buddha. The latter tradition is corroborated by several instances in the early Buddhist texts, in which Ananda appears younger than the Buddha, such as the passage in which the Buddha explained to Ananda how old age was affecting him in body and mind. It is also corroborated by a verse in the Pali text called Theragatha, in which Ananda stated he was a «learner» for 25 years, after which he attended to the Buddha for another 25 years. Following the Pali, Mahisasaka and Dharmaguptaka textual traditions, Ananda became a monk in the second year of the Buddha's ministry, during the Buddha's visit to Kapilavatu Sanskrit, Kapilavasta. He was ordained by the Buddha himself, together with many other princes of the Buddha's clan Pali, Sakya, Sanskrit, Sakya, in the mango grove called Anupya, part of Mala territory. According to a text from the Mahasangika tradition, King Suddhodana wanted the Buddha to have more followers of the Katya caste Sanskrit, Kasatriya, lit. Warrior noble, member of the ruling class, and less from the Brahmin priest caste. He therefore ordered that any Katya who had a brother follow the Buddha as a monk, or had his brother do so. Ananda used this opportunity, and asked his brother Devadatta to stay at home, so that he could leave for the monkhood. The later timeline from the Mulasarvastivada texts and the Pali Theragatha, however, have Ananda ordained much later, about 25 years before the Buddha's death, in other words, 20 years in the Buddha's ministry. Some Sanskrit sources have him ordain even later. The Mulasarvastivada texts on monastic discipline Pali and Sanskrit, Vinaya, relate that soothsayers predicted Ananda would be the Buddha's attendant. In order to prevent Ananda from leaving the palace to ordain, his father brought him to Vesali Sanskrit, Vesali during the Buddha's visit to Kapilavatu, but later the Buddha met and taught Ananda nonetheless. On a similar note, the Mahavasta relates, however, that Murji was initially opposed to Ananda joining the holy life, because his brother Devadatta had already ordained and left the palace. Ananda responded to his mother's resistance by moving to Videha Sanskrit, Vedeha, and lived there, taking a vow of silence. This led him to gain the epithet Vidihamuni Sanskrit, Vedihamuni, meaning the silent wise one from Videha. 
When Ananda did become ordained, his father had him ordained in Kapilavatu in the Nigrodharama Monastery Sanskrit, with much ceremony. Ananda's preceptor Pali, Upajaya, Sanskrit, Upadaya, being a certain Dasabala Kasyapa. According to the Pali tradition, Ananda's first teachers were Belathasisa and Punamantaniputta. It was Puna's teaching that led Ananda to attain the stage of Sotapanna Sanskrit, Shrodapana, an attainment preceding that of enlightenment. Ananda later expressed his debt to Puna. Another important figure in the life of Ananda was Sariputta Sanskrit, Sariputra, one of the Buddha's main disciples. Sariputta often taught Ananda about the finer points of Buddhist doctrine, they were in the habit of sharing things with one another, and their relationship is described as a good friendship. In some Mulasarvastivada texts, an attendant of Ananda is also mentioned who helped motivate Ananda when he was banned from the first Buddhist council. He was a Vajiputta. Sanskrit, Virjiputra, i.e. someone who originated from the Vajji confederacy. According to later texts, an enlightened monk also called Vajiputta Sanskrit, Vajraputra had an important role in Ananda's life. He listened to a teaching of Ananda and realized that Ananda was not enlightened yet. Vajiputta encouraged Ananda to talk less to laypeople and deepen his meditation practice by retreating in the forest, advice that very much affected Ananda. <laughs> <laughs> Attending to the Buddha In the first twenty years of the Buddha's ministry, the Buddha had several personal attendants. However, after these twenty years, when the Buddha was aged fifty-five, the Buddha announced that he had need for a permanent attendant. The Buddha had been growing older, and his previous attendants had not done their job very well. Initially, several of the Buddha's foremost disciples responded to his request, but the Buddha did not accept them. All the while Ananda remained quiet. When he was asked why, he said that the Buddha would know best who to choose, upon which the Buddha responded by choosing Ananda. Ananda agreed to take on the position, on the condition that he did not receive any material benefits from the Buddha. Accepting such benefits would open him up to criticism that he chose the position because of ulterior motives. He also requested that the Buddha allow him to accept invitations on his behalf, allow him to ask questions about his doctrine, and repeat any teaching that the Buddha had taught in Ananda's absence. These requests would help people trust Ananda and show that the Buddha was sympathetic to his attendant. Furthermore, Ananda considered these the real advantages of being an attendant, which is why he requested them. The Buddha agreed to Ananda's conditions, and Ananda became the Buddha's attendant, accompanying the Buddha on most of his wanderings. Ananda took care of the Buddha's daily practical needs, by doing things such as bringing water and cleaning the Buddha's dwelling place. He is depicted as observant and devoted, even guarding the dwelling place at night. Ananda takes the part of interlocutor in many of the recorded dialogues. He tended the Buddha for a total of 25 years, a duty which entailed much work. His relationship with the Buddha is depicted as warm and trusting. When the Buddha grew ill, Ananda had a sympathetic illness. When the Buddha grew older, Ananda kept taking care of him with devotion. Ananda sometimes literally risked his life for his teacher. At one time, the rebellious monk Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha by having a drunk and wild elephant released in the Buddha's presence. Ananda stepped in front of the Buddha to protect him. When the Buddha told him to move, he refused, although normally he always obeyed the Buddha. Through a supernatural accomplishment Pali, IDDHI, Sanskrit, Riddhi, the Buddha then moved Ananda aside and subdued the elephant, by touching it and speaking to it with loving kindness. Ananda often acted as an intermediary and secretary, passing on messages from the Buddha, informing the Buddha of news, invitations, or the needs of lay people, and advising lay people who wanted to provide gifts to the Sangha. 
At one time, Mahapajapati, the Buddha's foster mother, requested to offer robes for personal use for the Buddha. She said that even though she had raised the Buddha in his youth, she never gave anything in person to the young prince, she now wished to do so. The Buddha initially insisted that she give the robe to the community as a whole rather than to be attached to his person. However, Ananda interceded and mediated, suggesting that the Buddha had better accept the robe. Eventually the Buddha did, but not without pointing out to Ananda that good deeds like giving should always be done for the sake of the action itself, not for the sake of the person. The texts say that the Buddha sometimes asked Ananda to substitute for him as teacher, and was often praised by the Buddha for his teachings. Ananda was often given important teaching roles, such as regularly teaching Queen Malika, Queen Samavati, Sanskrit, Siamavati, and other people from the ruling class. Once Ananda taught a number of King Udina Sanskrit, Udayana's concubines. They were so impressed by Ananda's teaching, that they gave him 500 robes, which Ananda accepted. Having heard about this, King Udina criticized Ananda for being greedy. Ananda responded by explaining how every single robe was carefully used, reused, and recycled by the monastic community, prompting the king to offer another 500 robes. Ananda also had a role in the Buddha's visit to Visali. In this story, the Buddha taught the well-known text Ratana Sutta to Ananda, which Ananda then recited in Visali, ridding the city from illness, drought and evil spirits in the process. Another well-known passage in which the Buddha taught Ananda is the passage about spiritual friendship Pali, in this passage, Ananda stated that spiritual friendship is half of the holy life. The Buddha corrected Ananda, stating that such friendship is the entire holy life. In summary, Ananda worked as an assistant, intermediary, and a mouthpiece, helping the Buddha in many ways, and learning his teachings in the process. Resisting temptations Ananda was attractive in appearance. A Pali account related that a bhikkhuni nun became enamored with Ananda, and pretended to be ill to have Ananda visit her. When she realized the error of her ways, she confessed her mistakes to Ananda. Other accounts relate that a low-caste woman called Prakirti fell in love with Ananda, and persuaded her mother Matangi to use a black magic spell to enchant him. This succeeded, and Ananda was lured into her house, but came to his senses and called upon the help of the Buddha. The Buddha then taught Prakirti to reflect on the repulsive qualities of the human body, and eventually Prakirti was ordained as a bhikkhuni, giving up her attachment for Ananda. In an East Asian version of the story in the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha sent Manyasri to help Ananda, who used recitation to counter the magic charm. The Buddha then continued by teaching Ananda and other listeners about the Buddha nature. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Establishing the Nuns Order. In the role of mediator between the Buddha and the lay communities, Ananda sometimes made suggestions to the Buddha for amendments in the monastic discipline. Most importantly, the early texts attribute the inclusion of women in the early Sangha monastic order to Ananda. Fifteen years after the Buddha's enlightenment, his foster mother Mahapajapati came to see him to ask him to be ordained as the first Buddhist bhikkhuni. Initially, the Buddha refused this. Five years later, Mahapajapati came to request the Buddha again, this time with a following of other Sakya women, including the Buddha's former wife Yasodhara Sanskrit, Yasodhara. They had walked 500 kilometers 310 miles, looked dirty, tired and depressed, and Ananda felt pity for them. Ananda therefore confirmed with the Buddha whether women could become enlightened as well. Although the Buddha conceded this, he did not allow the Sakya women to be ordained yet. 
Ananda then discussed with the Buddha how Mahapajapati took care of him during his childhood, after the death of his real mother. Ananda also mentioned that previous Buddhas had also ordained bhikkhunis. In the end, the Buddha allowed the Sakya women to be ordained, being the start of the bhikkhuni order. Ananda had Mahapajapati ordained by her acceptance of a set of rules, set by the Buddha. These came to be known as the Garudhamma, and they described the subordinate relation of the bhikkhuni community to that of the bhikkhus or monks. Scholar of Asian religions Reiko Onuma argues that the debt the Buddha had toward his foster mother Mahapajapati may have been the main reason for his concessions with regard to the establishment of a bhikkhuni order. Many scholars interpret this account to mean that the Buddha was reluctant in allowing women to be ordained, and that Ananda successfully persuaded the Buddha to change his mind. For example, Indologist and translator I.B. Horner wrote that, "...this is the only instance of his the Buddha being over-persuaded in argument." However, some scholars interpret the Buddha's initial refusal rather as a test of resolve, following a widespread pattern in the Pali Canon and in monastic procedure of repeating a request three times before final acceptance. Some also argue that the Buddha was believed by Buddhists to be omniscient, and therefore is unlikely to have been depicted as changing his mind. Other scholars argue that other passages in the texts indicate the Buddha intended all along to establish a bhikkhuni order. Regardless, during the acceptance of women into the monastic order, the Buddha told Ananda that the Buddha's dispensation would last shorter because of this. At the time, the Buddhist monastic order consisted of wandering celibate males, without many monastic institutions. Allowing women to join the Buddhist celibate life might have led to dissension, as well as temptation between the sexes. The Garudhamma, however, were meant to fix these problems, and prevent the dispensation from being curtailed. There are some chronological discrepancies in the traditional account of the setting up of the bhikkhuni order. According to the Pali and Mahisasaka textual traditions, the bhikkhuni order was set up five years after the Buddha's enlightenment, but, according to most textual traditions, Ananda only became a tenant twenty years after the Buddha's enlightenment. Furthermore, Mahapajapati was the Buddha's foster mother, and must therefore have been considerably older than him. However, after the bhikkhuni order was established, Mahapajapati still had many audiences with the Buddha, as reported in Pali and Chinese early Buddhist texts. Because of this and other reasons, it could be inferred that establishment of the bhikkhuni order actually took place early in the Buddha's ministry. If this is the case, Ananda's role in establishing the order becomes less likely. Some scholars therefore interpret the names in the account, such as Ananda and Mahapajapati, as symbols, representing groups rather than specific individuals. According to the texts, Ananda's role in founding the bhikkhuni order made him popular with the bhikkhuni community. Ananda often taught bhikkhunis, often encouraged women to ordain, and when he was criticized by the monk Mahakasapa, several bhikkhunis tried to defend him. According to Indologist Oscar von Hinuber, Ananda's pro-bhikkhuni attitude may well be the reason why there was frequent discussion between Ananda and Mahakasapa, eventually leading Mahakasapa to charge Ananda with several offences during the First Buddhist Council. Von Hinuber further argues that the establishment of the bhikkhuni order may have well been initiated by Ananda after the Buddha's death, and the introduction of Mahapajapati as the person requesting to do so is merely a literary device to connect the ordination of women with the person of the Buddha, through his foster mother. Von Hinuber concludes this based on several patterns in the early texts, including the apparent distance between the Buddha and the bhikkhuni order, and the frequent discussions and differences of opinion that take place between Ananda and Mahakasapa. 
Some scholars have seen merits in von Hinuber's argument with regard to the pro and anti factions, but as of 2017, no definitive evidence has been found for the theory of establishment of the Bhikkhuni order after the Buddha's death. Buddhist studies scholar Bhikkhu Anilayo has responded to most of von Hinuber's arguments, writing, "...besides requiring too many assumptions, this hypothesis conflicts with nearly all the evidence preserved in the texts together." Arguing that it was monastic discipline that created a distance between the Buddha and the bhikkhunis, and even so, there were many places in the early texts where the Buddha did address bhikkhunis directly. The Buddha's death Despite his long association with and close proximity to the Buddha, the texts describe that Ananda had not become enlightened yet. Because of that, a fellow monk Udayi ridiculed Ananda. However, the Buddha reprimanded Udayi in response, saying that Ananda would certainly be enlightened in this life. The Pali Maha Parinibbana Sutta related the last year long trip the Buddha took with Ananda from Rajagaya Sanskrit, Rajagra to the small town of Kusinara Sanskrit, Kusingari before the Buddha died there. Before reaching Kusinara, the Buddha spent the retreat during the monsoon Pali, Vasa, Sanskrit, Varsa in Velagama Sanskrit, Venugramaka, getting out of the Visali area which suffered from famine. Here, the 80-year-old Buddha expressed his wish to speak to the Sangha once more. The Buddha had grown seriously ill in Visali, much to the concern of some of his disciples. Ananda understood that the Buddha wished to leave final instructions before his death. The Buddha stated, however, that he had already taught everything needed, without withholding anything secret as a teacher with a closed fist would. He also impressed upon Ananda that he did not think the Sangha should be reliant too much on a leader, not even himself. He then continued with the well-known statement to take his teaching as a refuge, and oneself as a refuge, without relying on any other refuge, also after he would be gone. Barreau argued that this is one of the most ancient parts of the text, found in slight variation in five early textual traditions. Moreover, this very beautiful episode, touching with nobility and psychological verisimilitude with regard to both Ananda and the Buddha, seems to go back very far, at the time when the authors, like the other disciples, still considered the Blessed One the Buddha, a man, an eminently respectable and undefiled master, to whom behavior and utterly human words were lent, so that one is even tempted to see there the memory of a real scene which Ananda reportedly told to the community in the months following the Parinirvana death of the, Buddha. the same text contains an account in which the Buddha, at numerous occasions, gave a hint that he could prolong his life to a full eon through a supernatural accomplishment, but this was a power that he would have to be asked to exercise. Ananda was distracted, however, and did not take the hint. Later, Ananda did make the request, but the Buddha replied that it was already too late, as he would die soon. Mara, the Buddhist personification of evil, had visited the Buddha, and the Buddha had decided to die in three months. When Ananda heard this, he wept. The Buddha consoled him, however, pointing out that Ananda had been a great attendant, being sensitive to the needs of different people. If he was earnest in his efforts, he would attain enlightenment soon. He then pointed out to Ananda that all conditioned things are impermanent, all people must die. In the final days of the Buddha's life, the Buddha traveled to Kusinara. The Buddha had Ananda prepare a place for lying down between two sal trees, the same type of tree under which the mother of the Buddha gave birth. The Buddha then had Ananda invite the Mala clan from Kusinara to pay their final respects. Having returned, Ananda asked the Buddha what should be done with his body after his death, and he replied that it should be cremated, giving detailed instructions on how this should be done. 
since the Buddha prohibited Ananda from being involved himself, but rather had him instruct the malice to perform the rituals, these instructions have by many scholars been interpreted as a prohibition that monastics should not be involved in funerals or worship of stupas structures with relics. Buddhist studies scholar Gregory Chopin has pointed out, however, that this prohibition only held for Ananda, and only with regard to the Buddha's funeral ceremony. It has also been shown that the instructions on the funeral are quite late in origin, in both composition and insertion into the text, and are not found in parallel texts, apart from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Ananda then continued by asking how devotees should honor the Buddha after his death. The Buddha responded by listing four important places in his life that people could pay their respects to, which later became the four main places of Buddhist pilgrimage. Before the Buddha died, Ananda recommended the Buddha to move to a more meaningful city instead, but the Buddha pointed out that the town was once a great capital. Ananda then asked who will be next teacher after the Buddha would be gone, but the Buddha replied that his teaching and discipline would be the teacher instead. This meant that decisions should be made by reaching consensus within the Sangha, and more generally, that now the time had come for the Buddhist monastics and devotees to take the Buddhist texts as authority. Now that the Buddha was dying, the Buddha gave several instructions before his death, including a directive that his former charioteer Chana Sanskrit, Chandaka be shunned by his fellow monks, to humble his pride. In his final moments, the Buddha asked if anyone had any questions they wished to pose to him, as a final chance to allay any doubts. When no one responded, Ananda expressed joy that all of the Buddha's disciples present had attained a level beyond doubts about the Buddha's teaching. However, the Buddha pointed out that Ananda spoke out of faith and not out of meditative insight—a final reproach. The Buddha added that, of all the five hundred monks that are surrounding him now, even the latest or most backward Pali, Pachimaka had attained the initial stage of Sotapanna. Meant as an encouragement, the Buddha was referring to Ananda. During the Buddha's final nirvana, Aniruddha was able to use his meditative powers to understand which stages the Buddha underwent before attaining final nirvana. However, Ananda was unable to do so, indicating his lesser spiritual maturity. After the Buddha's death, Ananda recited several verses, expressing a sense of urgency Pali, Samvega, deeply moved by the events and their bearing. "'Terrible was the quaking, men's hair stood on end, when the all-accomplished Buddha passed away." Shortly after the council, Ananda brought the message with regard to the Buddha's directive to Channa personally. Channa was humbled and changed his ways, attained enlightenment, and the penalty was withdrawn by the Sangha. Ananda travelled to Savathi Sanskrit, Srivasti, where he was met with a sad populace, who he consoled with teachings on impermanence. After that, Ananda went to the quarters of the Buddha and went through the motions of the routine he formerly performed when the Buddha was still alive, such as preparing water and cleaning the quarters. He then saluted and talked to the quarters as though the Buddha was still there. The Pali commentaries state that Ananda did this out of devotion, but also because he was not yet free from the passions. The First Council <laughs> Ban According to the texts, the first Buddhist council was held in Rajagaya. In the first Vasa after the Buddha had died, the presiding monk Mahakasapa Sanskrit, Mahakasyapa called upon Ananda to recite the discourses he had heard, as a representative on this council. There was a rule issued that only enlightened disciples arahants were allowed to attend the council, to prevent mental afflictions from clouding the disciples' memories. Ananda had, however, not attained enlightenment yet, in contrast with the rest of the council, consisting of 499 arahants. 
Mahakasapa therefore did not allow Ananda to attend yet. Although he knew that Ananda's presence in the council was required, he did not want to be biased by allowing an exception to the rule. The Mula Sarvastivada tradition adds that Mahakasapa initially allowed Ananda to join as a sort of servant assisting during the council, but then was forced to remove him when the disciple Aniruddha saw that Ananda was not yet enlightened. Ananda felt humiliated, but was prompted to focus his efforts to reach enlightenment before the council started. The Mula Sarvastivada texts add that he felt motivated when he remembered the Buddha's words that he should be his own refuge, and when he was consoled and advised by Aniruddha and Vajiputta, the latter being his attendant. On the night before the event, he tried hard to attain enlightenment. After a while, Ananda took a break and decided to lie down for a rest. He then attained enlightenment right there, right then, halfway between standing and lying down. Thus, Ananda was known as the disciple who attained awakening, in none of the four traditional poses, walking, standing, sitting, or lying down. The next morning, to prove his enlightenment, Ananda performed a supernatural accomplishment by diving into the earth and appearing on his seat at the council or, according to some sources, by flying through the air. Scholars such as Buddhologist André Barrow and scholar of religion Ellison Banks Findla have been skeptical about many details in this account, including the number of participants on the council, and the account of Ananda's enlightenment just before the council. Regardless, today, the story of Ananda's struggle on the evening before the council is still told among Buddhists as a piece of advice in the practice of meditation, neither to give up, nor to interpret the practice too rigidly. Recitations The first council began when Ananda was consulted to recite the discourses and to determine which were authentic and which were not. Mahakasapa asked of each discourse that Ananda listed where, when, and to whom it was given, and at the end of this, the assembly agreed that Ananda's memories and recitations were correct, after which the discourse collection Pali, Sutta Pataka, Sanskrit, Sutra Pataka was considered finalized and closed. Ananda therefore played a crucial role in this council, and texts claim he remembered 84,000 teaching topics, among which 82,000 taught by the Buddha and another 2,000 taught by disciples. Many early Buddhist discourses started with the words, Thus have I heard. Pali, Evam Mi Suttam, Sanskrit, Evam Maya Srutam, which according to most Buddhist traditions, were Ananda's words, indicating that he, as the person reporting the text Sanskrit, Samitikara, had first-hand experience and did not add anything to it. Thus, the discourses Ananda remembered later became the collection of discourses of the canon, and according to the Haimavada, Dharmaguptaka and Sarvastivada textual traditions and implicitly, post-canonical Pali chronicles, the collection of Abhidhamma as well. Scholar of religion Ronald Davidson notes, however, that this is not preceded by any account of Ananda learning Abhidhamma. According to some later Mahayana accounts, Ananda also assisted in reciting Mahayana texts, held in a different place in Rajagaya, but in the same time period. The Pali commentaries state that after the council, when the tasks for recitation and memorizing the texts were divided, Ananda and his pupils were given the task to remember the Diga Nikaya. Charges During the same council, Ananda was charged for an offence by members of the Sangha for having enabled women to join the monastic order. Besides this, he was charged for having forgotten to request the Buddha to specify which offences of monastic discipline could be disregarded, for having stepped on the Buddha's robe, for having allowed women to honour the Buddha's body after his death, which was not properly dressed, and during which his body was sullied by their tears, and for having failed to ask the Buddha to continue to live on. 
Ananda did not acknowledge these as offences, but he conceded to do a formal confession anyway. In faith of the opinion of the venerable elder monks, Ananda wanted to prevent disruption in the Sangha. With regard to having women ordained, Ananda answered that he had done this with great effort, because Mahapajapati was the Buddha's foster mother who had long provided for him. With regard to not requesting the Buddha to continue to live, many textual traditions have Ananda respond by saying he was distracted by Mara, though one early Chinese text has Ananda reply he did not request the Buddha to prolong his life, for fear that this would interfere with the next Buddha Maitreya's ministry. According to the Pali tradition, the charges were laid after Ananda had become enlightened and done all the recitations, but the Mulasarvastivada tradition has it that the charges were laid before Ananda became enlightened and started the recitations. In this version, when Ananda heard that he was banned from the council, he objected that he had not done anything that went against the teaching and discipline of the Buddha. Mahakasapa then listed seven charges to counter Ananda's objection. The charges were similar to the five given in Pali. Other textual traditions list slightly different charges, amounting to a combined total of eleven charges, some of which are only mentioned in one or two textual traditions. Considering that an enlightened disciple was seen to have overcome all faults, it seems more likely that the charges were laid before Ananda's attainment than after. Indologists von Hinuber and Jean Perzaluski argue that the account of Ananda being charged with offences during the council indicate tensions between competing early Buddhist schools, i.e., schools that emphasized the discourses Pali, Sutta, Sanskrit, Sutra, and schools that emphasized monastic discipline. These differences have affected the scriptures of each tradition, e.g. the Pali and Mahisasaka textual traditions portray a Mahakasapa that is more critical of Ananda than that the Sarvastivada tradition depicts him, reflecting a preference for discipline above discourse on the part of the former traditions, and a preference for discourse for the latter. Another example is the recitations during the First Council. The Pali texts state that Upali, the person who was responsible for the recitation of the monastic discipline, recited before Ananda does, again, monastic discipline above discourse. Analyzing six recensions of different textual traditions of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta extensively, Barrow distinguished two layers in the text, an older and a newer one, the former belonging to the compilers that emphasized discourse, the latter to the ones that emphasized discipline, the former emphasizing the figure of Ananda, the latter Mahakasapa. He further argued that the passage on Mara obstructing the Buddha was inserted in the 4th century BCE, and that Ananda was blamed for Mara's doing by inserting the passage of Ananda's forgetfulness in the 3rd century BCE. The passage in which the Buddha was ill and reminded Ananda to be his own refuge, on the other hand, Baro regarded as very ancient, pre-dating the passages blaming Mara and Ananda. In conclusion, Barrow, Perzaluski and Horner argued that the offences Ananda were charged with were a later interpolation. Findla disagrees, however, because the account in the texts of monastic discipline fits in with the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and with Ananda's character as generally depicted in the texts. Historicity. <laughs> <laughs> Tradition states that the First Council lasted for seven months. Scholars doubt, however, whether the entire canon was really recited during the First Council, because the early texts contain different accounts on important subjects such as meditation. It may be, though, that early versions were recited of what is now known as the Vinaya Pitaka and Sutta Pit a.k.a. Nevertheless, many scholars, from the late 19th century onward, have considered the historicity of the First Council improbable. Some scholars, such as Orientalists Louis de la Vallée Poussin and D. P. Minayev, thought there must have been assemblies after the Buddha's death, but considered only the main characters and some events before or after the First Council historical. 
Other scholars, such as Burrow and Indologist Hermann Oldenburg, considered it likely that the account of the First Council was written after the Second Council, and based on that of the Second, since there were not any major problems to solve after the Buddha's death, or any other need to organize the First Council. Much material in the accounts, and even more so in the more developed later accounts, deal with Ananda as the unsullied intermediary who passes on the legitimate teaching of the Buddha. On the other hand, archaeologist Louis Fanot, Indologist E. E. Abermuller and to some extent Indologist Nalinakshadut thought the account of the First Council was authentic, because of the correspondences between the Pali texts and the Sanskrit traditions. Indologist Richard Gombrich, following Bhikkhu Sujato and Bhikkhu Brahmali's arguments, states that, "...it makes good sense to believe that large parts of the Pali Canon do preserve for us the Buddha Vikana, the Buddha's words, transmitted to us via his disciple Ananda and the First Council." Role and character Ananda was recognized as one of the most important disciples of the Buddha. In the lists of the disciples given in the Anguttara Nikaya and Samyutta Nikaya, each of the disciples is declared to be foremost in some quality. Ananda is mentioned more often than any other disciple, he is named foremost in conduct, in attention to others, in power of memory, in erudition and in resoluteness. Ananda was the subject of a sermon of praise delivered by the Buddha just before the Buddha's death, as described in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, it is a sermon about a man who is kindly, unselfish, popular, and thoughtful toward others. In the texts he is depicted as compassionate in his relations with lay people, a compassion he learnt from the Buddha. The Buddha relays that both monastics and lay people were pleased to see Ananda, and were pleased to hear him recite and teach the Buddha's teaching. Moreover, Ananda was known for his organizational skills, assisting the Buddha with secretary-like duties. In many ways, Ananda did not only serve the personal needs of the Buddha, but also the needs of the still young, growing institute of the Sangha. Moreover, because of his ability to remember the many teachings of the Buddha, he is described as foremost in having heard much. Pali, Bausuta, Sanskrit, Bausruta, Pinyin, Duowen Diyi. Ananda was known for his exceptional memory, which is essential in helping him to remember the Buddha's teachings. He also taught other disciples to memorize Buddhist doctrine. For these reasons, Ananda became known as the treasurer of the Dhamma. Pali, Dhamma Bandagarika, Sanskrit, Dharma Bandagarika, Dhamma, Sanskrit, Dharma, referring to the doctrine of the Buddha. Being the person who had accompanied the Buddha throughout a great part of his life, Ananda was in many ways the living memory of the Buddha, without which the Sangha would be much worse off. Besides his memory skills, Ananda also stood out in that, as the Buddha's cousin, he dared to ask the Buddha direct questions. For example, after the death of Mahavira and the depicted subsequent conflicts among the Jain community, Ananda asked the Buddha how such problems could be prevented after the Buddha's death. However, Findla argues that Ananda's duty to memorize the Buddha's teachings accurately and without distortion, was, "...both a gift and a burden." Ananda was able to remember many discourses verbatim, but this also went hand in hand with the habit of not reflecting on those teachings, being afraid that reflection might distort the teachings as he heard them. At multiple occasions, Ananda was warned by other disciples that he should spend less time on conversing to lay people, and more time on his own practice. Even though Ananda regularly practiced meditation for long hours, he was less experienced in meditative concentration than other leading disciples. Thus, judgment of Ananda's character depends on whether one judges his accomplishments as a monk or his accomplishments as an attendant, and person memorizing the discourses. 
From a literary and pedagogical point of view, Ananda often functioned as a kind of foil in the texts, being an unenlightened disciple attending to an enlightened Buddha. Because the run-of-the-mill person could identify with Ananda, the Buddha could through Ananda convey his teachings to the mass easily. Ananda's character was in many ways a contradiction to that of the Buddha, being unenlightened and someone who made mistakes. At the same time, however, he was completely devoted to service to the Buddha. The Buddha is depicted in the early texts as both a father and a teacher to Ananda, stern but compassionate. Ananda was very fond of and attached to the Buddha, willing to give his life for him. He mourned the deaths of both the Buddha and Sariputta, with whom he enjoyed a close friendship, in both cases Ananda was very shocked. Ananda's faith in the Buddha, however, constituted more of a faith in other people, especially the Buddha's person, as opposed to faith in the Buddha's teaching. This is a pattern which comes back in the accounts which lead to the offenses Ananda was charged with during the First Council. Moreover, Ananda's weaknesses described in the texts were that he was sometimes slow-witted and lacked mindfulness, which became noticeable because of his role as attendant to the Buddha. This involved minor matters like deportment, but also more important matters, such as ordaining a man with no future as a pupil, or disturbing the Buddha at the wrong time. For example, one time Mahakasapa chastised Ananda in strong words, criticizing the fact that Ananda was traveling with a large following of young monks who appeared untrained and who had built up a bad reputation. In another episode described in a Sarvastivada text, Ananda is the only disciple who was willing to teach psychic powers to Devadatta, who later would use these in an attempt to destroy the Buddha. According to a Mahisasaka text, however, when Devadatta had turned against the Buddha, Ananda was not persuaded by him, and voted against him in a formal meeting. Ananda's late spiritual growth is much discussed in Buddhist texts, and the general conclusion is that Ananda was slower than other disciples due to his worldly attachments and his attachment to the person of the Buddha, both of which were rooted in his mediating work between the Buddha and the lay communities. Topic. Passing on the teaching After the Buddha's death, some sources say Ananda stayed mostly in the west of India, in the area of Kosambi Sanskrit, Kasambi, where he taught most of his pupils. Other sources say he stayed in the monastery at Veluvana Sanskrit, Venuvana. Several pupils of Ananda became well-known in their own right. According to post-canonical Sanskrit sources such as the Divyavadana and the Asokavadana, before the Buddha's death, the Buddha confided to Ananda that the latter's student Majantaka, Sanskrit, Madhyantaka would travel to Udhyana, Kashmir, to bring the teaching of the Buddha there. Mahakasapa made a prediction that later would come true that another of Ananda's future pupils, Sanavasi Sanskrit, Sanakavasi, Sanakavasan or Sanavasika, would make many gifts to the Sangha at Mathura, during a feast held from prophets of successful business. After this event, Ananda would successfully persuade Sanavasi to become ordained and be his pupil. Ananda later persuaded Sanavasi by pointing out that the latter had now made many material gifts, but had not given the gift of the Dhamma. When asked for explanation, Ananda replied that Sanavasi would give the gift of Dhamma by becoming ordained as a monk, which was reason enough for Sanavasi to make the decision to get ordained. Death and relics Though no early Buddhist text provides a date for Ananda's death, according to the Chinese pilgrim monk Faxian 337-422 CE, Ananda went on to live 120 years. Following the later timeline, however, Ananda may have lived to 75-85 years. 
Buddhist studies scholar L. S. Cousins dated Ananda's death twenty years after the Buddhas. Ananda was teaching till the end of his life. According to Mulasarvastivada sources, Ananda heard a young monk recite a verse incorrectly, and advised him. When the monk reported this to his teacher, the latter objected that, Ananda has grown old and his memory is impaired. This prompted Ananda to attain final nirvana. He passed on the ''custody of the Buddha's doctrine'' to his pupil Sanavasi and left for the river Ganges. However, according to Pali sources, when Ananda was about to die, he decided to spend his final moments in Visali instead, and travelled to the river Rahini. The Mulasarvastivada version expands and says that before reaching the river, he met with a seer called Majantaka following the prediction earlier and 500 of his followers, who converted to Buddhism. Some sources add that Ananda passed the Buddha's message on to him. When Ananda was crossing the river, he was followed by King Ajisattu Sanskrit, Ajatasatru, who wanted to witness his death and was interested in his remains as relics. Ananda had once promised Ajisattu that he would let him know when he would die, and accordingly, Ananda had informed him. On the other side of the river, however, a group of Lichavas from Visali awaited him for the same reason. In the Pali, there were also two parties interested, but the two parties were the Sakyan and the Kolian clans instead. Ananda realized that his death on either side of the river could anger one of the parties involved. Through a supernatural accomplishment, he therefore surged into the air to levitate and meditate in mid-air, making his body go up in fire, with his relics landing on both banks of the river, or in some versions of the account, splitting in four parts. In this way, Ananda had pleased all the parties involved. In some other versions of the account, including the Mulasarvastivada version, his death took place on a barge in the middle of the river, however, instead of in mid-air. The remains were divided in two, following the wishes of Ananda, Majantaka later successfully carried out the mission following the Buddha's prediction. The latter's pupil Upagupta was described to be the teacher of King Asoka 3th century BCE. Together with four or five other pupils of Ananda, Sanavasi and Majantaka formed the majority of the Second Council, with Majantaka being Ananda's last pupil. Post-canonical Pali sources add that Sanavasi had a leading role in the Third Buddhist Council as well. Although little is historically certain, Cousins thought it likely at least one of the leading figures on the Second Council was a pupil of Ananda, as nearly all the textual traditions mention a connection with Ananda. Ajisattu is said to have built a stupa on top of the Ananda's relics, at the river Rahini, or according to some sources, the Ganges, the Lichavas had also built a stupa at their side of the river. The Chinese pilgrim Zan Zhang later visited stupas on both sides of the river Rahini. Faxian also reported having visited stupas dedicated to Ananda at the river Rahini, but also in Mathura. Moreover, according to the Mulasarvastivada version of the Samyukta Agama, King Asoka visited and made the most lavish offerings he ever made to a stupa. He explains to his ministers that he did this because t he body of the Tathagata is the body of dharmas, pure in nature. He Ananda was able to retain it, them all, for this reason the offerings to him surpass all others. Body of Dharma here referred to the Buddha's teachings as a whole. In early Buddhist texts, Ananda had reached final nirvana and would no longer be reborn. But, in contrast with the early texts, according to the Mahayana Lotus Sutra, Ananda would be born as a Buddha in the future. He would accomplish this slower than the present Buddha, Gautama Buddha, had accomplished this, because Ananda aspired to becoming a Buddha by applying great learning. Because of this long trajectory and great efforts, however, his enlightenment would be extraordinary and with great splendor. Topic. 
Topic: Legacy. Ananda is depicted as an eloquent speaker, who often taught about the self and about meditation. There are numerous Buddhist texts attributed to Ananda, including the Atthakanagara Sutta, about meditation methods to attain nirvana, a version of the Bhadakarata Sutta Sanskrit, Bhadrakaratri, Pinyin, Shanye, about living in the present moment, the Seika Sutta, about the higher training of a disciple of the Buddha, the Subha Suttanta, about the practices the Buddha inspired others to follow. In the Gopaka Moggallanasutta, a conversation took place between Ananda, the Brahmin Gopaka Moggallana and the minister Vasakara, the latter being the highest official of the Magadha region. During this conversation, which occurred shortly after the Buddha's death, Vasakara asked whether it was decided yet who would succeed the Buddha. Ananda replied that no such successor had been appointed, but that the Buddhist community took the Buddha's teaching and discipline as a refuge instead. Furthermore, the Sangha did not have the Buddha as a master anymore, but they would honor those monks who were virtuous and trustworthy. Besides these suttas, a section of the Theragatha is attributed to Ananda. Even in the texts attributed to the Buddha himself, Ananda is sometimes depicted giving a name to a particular text, or suggesting a simile to the Buddha to use in his teachings. In East Asian Buddhism, Ananda is considered one of the ten principal disciples. In many Indian Sanskrit and East Asian texts, Ananda is considered the second patriarch of the lineage which transmitted the teaching of the Buddha, with Mahakasapa being the first and Majantaka or Sanavasi being the third. There is an account dating back from the Sarvastivada and Mulasarvastivada textual traditions which states that before Mahakasapa died, he bestowed the Buddha's teaching on Ananda as a formal passing on of authority, telling Ananda to pass the teaching on to Ananda's pupil Sanavasi. Later, just before Ananda died, he did as Mahakasapa had told him to. Buddhist studies scholars Akira Hirakawa and Bibhuti Barua have expressed skepticism about the teacher-student relationship between Mahakasapa and Ananda, arguing that there was discord between the two, as indicated in the early texts. Regardless, it is clear from the texts that a relationship of transmission of teachings is meant, as opposed to a Upajaya student relationship in a lineage of ordination. No source indicates Mahakasapa was Ananda's Upajaya. Whatever the case, in Mahayana iconography, Ananda is often depicted flanking the Buddha at the right side, together with Mahakasapa at the left. In Theravada iconography, however, Ananda is usually not depicted in this manner, and the motif of transmission of the Dhamma through a list of patriarchs is not found in Pali sources. Because Ananda was instrumental in founding the Bhikkhuni community, he has been honored by Bhikkhunis for this throughout Buddhist history. The earliest traces of this can be found in the writings of Faxian and Zan Zhang, who reported that bhikkhunis made offerings to a stupa in Ananda's honor during celebrations and observance days. On a similar note, in 5th 6th century China and 10th century Japan, Buddhist texts were composed recommending women to uphold the semi monastic eight precepts in honor and gratitude of Ananda. In Japan, this was done through the format of a penance ritual called keka Chinese. By the 13th century, in Japan a cult-like interest for Ananda had developed in a number of convents, in which images and stupas were used and ceremonies were held in his honor. Presently, opinion among scholars is divided as to whether Ananda's cult among bhikkhunis was an expression of their dependence on male monastic tradition, or the opposite, an expression of their legitimacy and independence. Pali Vinaya texts attribute the design of the Buddhist monk's robe to Ananda. As Buddhism prospered, more laypeople started to donate expensive cloth for robes, which put the monks at risk for theft. To decrease its commercial value, monks therefore cut up the cloth offered, before they sew a robe from it. The Buddha asked Ananda to think of a model for a Buddhist robe, made from small pieces of cloth. 
Ananda designed a standard robe model, based on the rice fields of Magadha, which were divided in sections by banks of earth. Another tradition that is connected to Ananda is Parita recitation. Theravada Buddhists explain that the custom of sprinkling water during Parita chanting originates in Ananda's visit to Visali, when he recited the Ratana Sutta and sprinkled water from his alms bowl. A third tradition sometimes attributed to Ananda is the use of Bodhi trees in Buddhism. It is described in the text Kalingabodhi Jataka that Ananda planted a Bodhi tree as a symbol of the Buddha's enlightenment, to give people the chance to pay their respects to the Buddha. This tree and shrine came to be known as the Ananda Bodhi tree, said to have grown from a seed from the original Bodhi tree under which the Buddha is depicted to have attained enlightenment. Many of this type of Bodhi tree shrines in Southeast Asia were erected following this example. Presently, the Ananda Bodhi tree is sometimes identified with a tree at the ruins of Jetavana, Savathi, based on the records of Faxian. In art Between 1856 and 1858 Richard Wagner wrote a draft for an opera libretto based on the legend about Ananda and the low-caste girl Prakirti. He left only a fragmentary prose sketch of a work to be called Die Seeger, but the topic inspired his later opera Parsifal. Furthermore, the draft was used by composer Jonathan Harvey in his 2007 opera Wagner Dream. In Wagner's version of the legend, which he based on Orientalist Eugene Burnuff's translations, the magical spell of Prakirti's mother does not work on Ananda, and Prakirti turns to the Buddha to explain her desires for Ananda. The Buddha replies that a union between Prakirti and Ananda is possible, but Prakirti must agree to the Buddha's conditions. Prakirti agrees, and it is revealed that the Buddha means something else than she does. He asks Prakirti to ordain as a bhikkhuni, and live the celibate life as a kind of sister to Ananda. At first, Prakirti weeps in dismay, but after the Buddha explains that her current situation is a result of karma from her previous life, she understands and rejoices in the life of a bhikkhuni. Apart from the spiritual themes, Wagner also addresses the faults of the caste system by having the Buddha criticize it. Drawing from Schopenhauer's philosophy, Wagner contrasts desire driven salvation and true spiritual salvation, by seeking deliverance through the person she loves. Prakirti only affirms her will to live, German, will zoom leben, which is blocking her from attaining deliverance. By being ordained as a bhikkhuni she strives for her spiritual salvation instead. Thus, the early Buddhist account of Mahapajapati's ordination is replaced by that of Prakirti. According to Wagner, by allowing Prakirti to become ordained, the Buddha also completes his own aim in life. H. E. regards his existence in the world, whose aim was to benefit all beings, as completed, since he had become able to offer deliverance—without mediation—also to woman." The same legend of Ananda and Prakirti was made into a short prose play by the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, called Chandalika. Chandalika deals with the themes of spiritual conflict, caste and social equality, and contains a strong critique of Indian society. Just like in the traditional account, Prakirti falls in love with Ananda, after he gives her self-esteem by accepting a gift of water from her. Prakirti's mother casts a spell to enchant Ananda. In Tagore's play, however, Prakirti later regrets what she has done and has the spell revoked. Topic Notes Equals equals citations <laughs>